Yeah. I love my HBCU. And bar. I love it, love it. I love it, love it. I love my HBCU. And man. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. Man. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I tune into the ACCU Sports Lab to see if my team won a loss. If they lost, I'm quiet as a mouth. But if they won, she tab. Uh, I'ma do the dab, yeah. Dr. Cavill, he know what he be talking about. Mike and Charles, they know what they be talking about. They compress the analytic data with the hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they won a loss. Yeah, and who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, uh, yes sir, yes, and pay attention, boy. cause he gonna teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Mills inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. As you see, Mike Washington is out on assignment. At least that's what I was told by Charles <laughs> uh, as he passed on the message. But with that being said, welcome to episode 478, Countdown to 500 of Inside the HBC Sports Lab radio show and podcast, the show that's covering the sporty HBC dash for all things HBC sports for institutions large and small. From the NEIA to the NCAA, we share insights and information on the HBC sports culture, HBC athletic aesthetics to facilitate the story of HBC athletic programs and the business of HBC sports. Simply put, we call it HBC Sports Pedagogy. I'm your host, Dr. Kenyatta Cabello, along with my co-host, Charles Bishop. We're filming from our home studios and sending a signal live to KCOH 1230 AM studios with the Texas Hall of Famer, multi-Hall of Famer Ralph Cooper in the beautiful home of Texas Southern University from Houston, Texas. With that being said, Charles, I like the uh, hood there. How's it going? Yeah, doing well, Doc. I had to uh, pay homage, you know, uh, Dr. King's uh, holiday this past Monday, so I wanted to represent Dr. King's fraternity, my fraternity, your fraternity as well, our, our fraternity incorporate. So, you know, I kind of lay out my hoodies during the course of, of the week, so I laid this one out for this week. We didn't go this past Tuesday, but I wanted to make sure I represent. I like that. I like that. I, I did that, and on Monday I got out to Texas Southern basketball game. They had the game <clears throat> early, so it worked out before – uh, it really got cold. I don't know if there's such thing as it was going to get colder that night. But man, I tell you, Deuce and I, we we bared the element, elements and made it out there uh, and saw the women lose a tough game. Credit to Mississippi Valley State, the Delta Devils that came from behind, continued to fight and got it done. The men just uh, really put it to the Delta Devils on the men's side. But it was great to see HBCU basketball in action, and I'm sure we'll get into a little more of that. Uh, we'll do our major division poll rankings. We'll sneak in a little bit of the mid-major. Just tell you what's going on. We'll do a little bit of the news segment here and give you some updates. Because uh, there was a major upset. Huge. As one of the top 10 teams in the uh, men's side of the mid-major division. So that's fascinating. Uh, but with that being said, before we get too far into it, what's on your mind, y'all? Yeah, well, we start things off uh, on a bit of a somber note, and this comes courtesy of Tuskegee University Athletics, uh, as Tuskegee mourns the loss of former football player and assistant coach Fred Ellis. And this is a statement from uh, uh, head coach uh, Aaron James, who is his former teammate and head coach. Uh, the news of Fred's passing is incredibly sad. Uh, Fred was an instrumental piece to this program during both of his stints here, one as a player and one as a coach. Our university and program are incredibly sad this day has come. We want to keep his family and loved ones in our thoughts. He will forever be missed. So I want to mention uh, that Coach Ellis, he joined the Golden Tigers coaching staff as offensive line coach following the 2021 season after two stints and miles spanning eight seasons in total. Uh, over the last two years, the Golden Tigers were 15-7, and seven, highlighted by an appearance in the 2023 SIAC football championship game and just lost three conference games uh, over the past uh, few years. Tuskegee also averaged over 100 yards in rushing both seasons, averaging 142 yards per game last season and 159 yards in 2022. So I definitely want to send uh, condolences uh, to the Tuskegee University family. Yeah, probably said to open it up that way, 
Um, and let's take a, a moment to pause uh, in his arm. With that being said, you know, for those that are joining the ancestors, um, uh, it, it's necessary that we understand that we continue to push through. We had to do it as we shut things down on Tuesday. It was just a little bit too much going on with the weather. To try to make it happen, had to make that call. So appreciate folks understanding and jumping back into that with us across the landscape. But with that being said, as we get into some more news, uh, I want to get into this a little bit, kind of tease this out as we open it up. Clark University knocks off number one team in D2. That was Benedict College on Saturday night. Got a chance to follow that game. Went into overtime to get it done for the first time in school history. Clark Atlanta Panthers, 10-3, 4-3. Remember, they jumped off to that start with 6-0 and and had a win over a top 25 team, so you knew they were talented. They got in conference play and had a couple of tough losses, but you see what they're capable of, particularly at home. Uh, they knocked off a top 10 national ranked team first time ever after taking down eighth ranked Benedict Tigers, who failed to 13 and 1, 7 and 1 in the conference race, 88 to 84, uh, in overtime on Saturday afternoon in front of a packed crowd inside F's gym. Chris Martin led all scores with the game high 32 points to pace the Panthers on the way to their 10th win of the season. Shimani Fuller was able to pull down a season high in game high 13 rebounds led by Clark Atlanta University on the boards. Stewart chipped in 19 points on 50% shooting from the field, 5 of 10, and from three-point range, 2 of 4, while also shooting an impressive 7 of 10, 70% from the charity stripe. Andrew Stewart also landed in double figures, 11 points and 6 rebounds in the win. Uh, defense was key as they get it going. Obviously, you called some games uh, last year in terms of the SIC. Uh, and weird how things have shifted, it seems. You know, for the longest, we thought AC in terms of football. We thought about CIAA as the basketball conference. Over the last decade, certainly maybe uh, five years or so, it seems like the power in football has went to the CIAA. And now maybe it's shifting that the basketball is coming to the SIC. Because you look at some of the tough teams, you know, Morehouse is doing well in terms of what's going down. And that's just all in what we preferably call the Eastern Division. You're over the West, Tuskegee and Miles, uh, getting it done, uh, and particularly Miles on the men's side. On the women's side, you got Tuskegee and Miles getting it done in a lot of ways. So uh, fascinating to see what SIAC uh, is going on there. And it'll be interesting to keep going with that type of news. What else you got going on in terms of HBCU news that's out there? Yeah, well, let's stay with it. As Langston's men's uh, Langston University men's basketball, they remain at number two in the NAIA coaches' top twenty-five poll. Uh, the Langston University men's basketball team remain uh, number two uh, in the number two slot in the fourth regular season edition of the NAIA men's basketball coaches' top twenty-five national office announced. Uh, Langston is currently fifteen and zero on the season and second. Overall, with 464 votes, the Lions are the highest-rated team in the Sooner Athletic Conference and are ranked in the NAIA Top 25 for the fifth consecutive NAIA Coaches Top 25 poll. Uh, the Lions return to action uh, on tonight where they take on Oklahoma Panhandle State, and that game is in Goodwill, Oklahoma. That's going to be a 745 tip for the Langston Lions. Man, they playing some good basketball. And that's not even thinking what they did last year, uh, doing five straight, straight weeks in the top 25 at the top of the conference. Um, they are the type of team that can literally go undefeated in conference play, run it in the tournament, and then get to the NIA tournament. Whether they lose uh, during conference play or in the tournament itself, you got to think, particularly if they can find a way to stay healthy, that they'll make a deep run in the NIA tournament um, that they got in last year, made it to the uh, second round before they kind of stubbed the toe. But you got to believe that they're looking about going deep. So I'm going to keep my eyes on this Langston Lions program, as well as the Benedict Tigers and a couple of other teams in the SIC. Fascinating when you talk about CIAA, when some Salem State took a loss this past weekend as they were riding high and try to get it done. So it'll be fascinating to kind of see what that talks about. 
But you know, we're going to find a way to get back to football, Charles. Always, find always. Get back to football. <laughs> <laughs> this is my name, Texas Southern head football coach from HBCU game day. Obviously, uh, they came out on Friday. Uh, we hadn't had a show since, so we'll jump on that and give uh, some love. We'll see if we can get Chris Dishman in uh, to give all our listeners some update information in terms of who and what he is and what he plans to do with Texas Southern University. But um, Chris Dishman got it done. They wanted a coach with uh, some NFL experience, and they got it. Former defensive back who spent a significant portion of his career in Houston has been hired as the program's next head coach. Texas Southern University Board of Regents finally cleared the hiring of a head coach. After nearly a month-long process, the news was reported by Kyle Mosley of HBCU Legends. Former Alcorn State uh, head coach Fred McNair was initially considered uh, shooting for the job back in December, but it was not to be. And now we have Dishman replacing Clarence McKinney, whose contract was not renewed by Texas Southern University this past season. I think it's interesting. A lot of folks thinking about that Labor Day Classic. Uh, you have two former teammates from the Houston Oilers literally play with each other. Bubba McDowell leading the Pervian and Panthers now will face off against Chris Dishman of Texas Southern University. And not to be outdone, obviously we have another Oiler over there. Many people familiar with <laughs> at Alabama State. Uh, and they all played <laughs> on the same <laughs> Houston Oilers team. Uh, as defensive backs, linebackers, some fascinating when that has in the mix. And then it's just not enough. You know, as karma would have it, as they exit uh, first year, uh, you have your Tennessee State coach over there who actually played with the Oilers as well, as many people know. So fascinating. Well, well Doc, if I'm Steve uh, Jackson, Haywood Jeffries, and some of those other lovely blue guys, I better dust off my resume because uh, – <laughs> Seems like if you if you got some love your blue and you you might be uh, considered for a head coaching job somewhere. It might work out for you. Uh, unfortunately, there's only two more HBCUs and uh, I mean only two public HBCUs in the state of Texas. So I, I don't know. Maybe they can, Alabama A and M. Maybe it's an Alabama Texas thing. Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> I tell you what. I, if I was uh, one of those. Final love you, blue guys. I'll be dusting off the old resume. I might get back into coaching here. Good stuff, good <laughs> stuff. With that, no what other news you got on your mind? Yeah, well, let's uh, turn our attention to Sean Gibbs. He's going to remain at Fort Valley State uh, after reported interest by FAMU. Uh, after reports of being a candidate for the head coaching job at Florida A&M, Fort Valley State Athletic Director Renee Miles Payne has announced that Sean Gibbs will remain with the Wildcats in a statement posted to uh, Twitter, uh, also X. Payne announced she and President Paul Jones renewed the contract with Gibbs in association with the Fort Valley State Athletic Association boards. After discussions regarding the extension began following our historic victory in the Florida Beach Bowl, despite enticing offers from other institutions seeking his expertise, Coach Gibbs has chosen to stay with us, reaffirming his commitment to our Wildcats in the face of opportunities elsewhere. Uh, we were proud to secure his continued leadership. So, uh, coach in 2022, Coach Gibbs uh, was hired as head coach of Fort Valley State after nearly 20 years as an assistant coach. So, kudos to Sean Gibbs for uh, getting that extension at Fort Valley State. Good stuff. Good stuff. I think we'll get it to, uh, at um, Florida A&M in regards to um, them continuing search. I know a lot of people have talked about how it has gone. I want to get in and give you a chance to really talk a little bit about um, what it looks like from an administrative perspective and things to consider from that perspective and the uniqueness of FAMU in regards to the HBCU spirit. Because oftentimes, obviously, we come together and celebrate HBCUs and we think uh, how we are uniquely placed and special together. But in a lot of ways, uh, there are some uniqueness that we don't always talk about. Maybe we'll get a chance to get on that. But with that being said, some more football news. NCAA rule change could have Division II HBC playing in week zero. Remember last year we came out uh, with Charlie Neal was the impetus of pushing uh, the SIAC and CIAA under the HBCU Go uh, broadcast network uh, in regards to having a SIAC, CIAA, CIAA, SIAC challenge, if you would, to kick off things. I thought it was unique because they were going to have the champions of the previous year playing the game match up. Well, they 
went to the NCAA and sought reprieve uh, to be able to play the game week zero, which none of the Division II programs could do. And so they were denied. Uh, they actually went twice and were denied both times. They got some more support with some other conferences, wanted to play maybe a week zero game. Some of them wanted to do it so they could get a break between the long season before they get into the playoffs uh, throughout the season, if you would. But it all came together, and they got the relief in terms of proposal 2024 uh, in regards to what it looks like. They had another proposal. Legislation would be interesting in terms of bracket seating where maybe conferences, like we see at the FCS level, uh, where a conference would get an automatic bid to the tournament. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a proposal to do that at the Division II level, uh, and it was defeated, though. It was opposed, and it went down. Why, um, again, the week zero proposal was passed. So interesting when you think about juxtaposing the two, uh, what that looks like uh, as we move forward in terms of those rankings. Be interesting to see uh, will HBC go move forward with the SIEC CIAA challenge, uh, for lack of better words, to what that looks like. One last thing I want to get in there before we go to this break, Charles. Athletic facility upgrades are included in a Virginia Union, check this out, half a billion dollar master plan. Yes, $500 wow. dollar master plan, which includes some facility updates, including athletics, which is part of a 10-year plan to reshape the look of the entire university. Man, this is a significant, robust plan. Quote, when we look at everything that is happening in Richmond, particularly the crescendoing of Scott addition development the question becomes not just about where will people work live in richmond but how do you also live learn and begin to love richmond and what will it be known for the new union president hakeem j lucas told jonathan spires of richmond's biz sense um, and so this will include some updates to the field uh the auditorium which they also have for graduations and other events uh, some dorm space and things of that nature. So a lot of things are included in this master plan. But I thought that was significant and wanted to get that out there. Uh, that ties to the athletics. Shout out to all those involved uh, under the leadership of the president there at Virginia Union University. With that, let's take our first break. We'll come back on the other side. We'll get into the women's major division poll ranking top five. See what Charles has to say. We'll come back on the other side. Stick with us. Be right back after this first break. We're back. It's time for the 2024 Urban Nerd Con. Join us in Atlanta, Georgia, April 26th through the 28th at the Cortland Grand Hotel. Special guests include Underworld creator Kevin Grievous, Gary Gray from Fairly Odd Parents, from Nickelodeon, Giovanni Samuels, The Science Machine, Michael Green, The Sci Fi Sisters, and from Spaceballs and Star Trek Voyager, Tim Russ. Hi, I'm Tim Russ. Join me April 26th through the 28th at the Courtland Grand Hotel in Atlanta, Georgia for the Urban Nerd Con. Our heroes, our villains, our stories, everyone con. I'll see you there. Live long and prosper. Visit TheUrbanNerdCon.net to get your buy one, get one free badges before the price increases. Remember, our heroes, our villains, our stories, everyone's con. See you there. Compressor analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they want a lot, yeah. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, uh, yes sir, yes sir. And pay attention, Boy. cause he gon' teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Bills inside the HBC Sports Lab with the major division top five poll rankings for the women in week number two. We did have a team that dropped out this week. Dropping out was UAPB, the Golden Lions, 79-201. Major upset that they had against Texas Southern Tigers right here in Houston. Fascinating to see how that went down. Uh, unfortunately for them, they didn't get to play the second game on Monday because of the weather that we talked about. Uh, they had to postpone that game. It has been scheduled for a makeup date in February. February 15th, I believe, is the date it will be made up. With that being said, let's go to those teams receiving votes. 
Southern Jaguars are playing some good basketball, went on the road, got some big wins in Florida. They are 5-10 and 10 overall, 3-1 and one in the conference race. Pine Bluffs, the Golden Lions are still in the <coughs> season polls at 7-9, Cobbin State Eagles, 5-11, and 2-0. And oh, jump into those receiving votes. Uh, did not play this weekend as essentially uh, the MEAC was off. You did have that Martin Luther King game with Howard and Morehouse, but the rest of the conference was off um, for the most part. Norfolk played uh, a game, a non-conference game as well in the mix. With that being said, the last team receiving votes is Alabama A&M. The Bulldogs sit at 8-9, 3-2. and two. Played a lot of games over the last couple of weeks. They came out of it with a winning record. So it'll be interesting to see how they can push that through for the rest of the season. With that being said, let's get into the top five program, starting with number five. Bethune Cookman, the Wildcats, uh, in number five, they do drop three spots as they go to uh, down to number five at 10 and six, one and two, 49 points overall, bringing us to number four. The Grambling State Tigers sit at nine and six, three and one, 57 points. They were not ranked. They jump in after they won two games this past weekend as they continue to go rolling. And, uh, with what's taking place there in that matchup. Let's take it to number three. At number three, you have the Jackson State Tigers. Uh, the women moved uh, at, up a spot for number four at 8-6, and 3-0 and oh with 61 points. Uh, they keep rolling as they are continue to get it done in conference play. Uh, interesting matchup as they hit the road this week. I don't think they have any problems, but we'll see what that looks like. At number two, North Carolina A&T State Aggies. Uh, all right, nine and six, three and one, seven and three. They move up a spot as they are rolling, doing well uh, from previously being ranked number three. At number one, Norfolk State Spartans, uh, twelve and four, two and zero. Oh, all eight first place votes, eighty points. They remain at number one in week number two. They would, did not have the games as things are flowing there. As you see them at number one uh, at twelve and four, two and zero oh, all overall. All. Uh, they are rolling and they. Uh, are really playing some good basketball. It'll be interesting to see just how far they'll make the run in the MEAC as things get going. With that being said, Charles, now time to get you in to see what your thoughts are on the major division for the women uh, basketball poll rankings. Yeah, I, I think when you take a look at uh, number one and number two teams, uh, Norfolk State, North Carolina A&T, uh, deservingly uh, Norfolk State number one, uh, probably. I might, I probably would move Jackson State up above North Carolina A&T. Uh, Jackson State, thus far, they've been as dominant as any team uh, out there, uh, especially uh, when you take a look at what they're doing uh, from a scoring and defensive perspective to teams, and, and then the, the rebound. And it has been another typical Jackson State performance with regards to what Tamika Reed is rolling out there. And now they have the outside score of Adriana Avan that really helps them out as well, the transfer from Texas Southern. Uh the, the surprising one, I believe, is Bethune-Cookman uh, at five. Uh, two, two tough losses with Grambling and Southern coming in this weekend. So I was curious to see how far uh, Bethune-Cookman might fall uh, in this week's rankings. And if not for uh, the surprise with FAMU knocking off Southern, uh, I thought probably Southern would have been sitting there at number five. But you had some, you had some oddities that happened this past weekend. I think Texas Southern – Knock it off UAPB. Nobody saw that coming. And then the fact that FAMU was able to knock off Southern, that was a shocker Saturday night as well. Good stuff there. And I agree with you, Charles. If um, Southern didn't get clipped with that loss this weekend, they probably would have jumped in over Bethune Cookman. And Bethune Cookman with the two losses would have fell out. Uh, but uh, not quite enough for teams jumping in there. But we saw those teams that are in the mix. So it's fascinating. Let me get to this and see what your thoughts on this matchup. Saturday, we have Southern in Gramlin. We have that Bayou Classic on the basketball side. It's in Gramlin, North uh, Louisiana, if you would. Southern comes in at 5 and 10, 3 and 1. Gramlin at 9 and 6, 3 and 1. Uh, both of them are in essentially the top 10 poll rankings, if you would. So it's a top 10 matchup in basketball early in the season. But both teams are 3 and 1. You love to beat your rival, but it's just as important to keep up with Jackson State uh, and not allow them to run away with it and give you a chance when you face them to make your statement. So I'm very interested in this matchup 
uh, more than any, particularly on the women's side for the SWAC. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and to me, uh, this early in the season, this is a real pick 'em game. It'll be on HBCU Go. Uh, but uh, Southern and Grambling, uh, anytime they get together, you know it's going to be uh, a really close, uh, tight game. Uh, can Southern go on the road and steal one on the road? That's going to be a very interesting dynamic. And when you take a look at some of the games this weekend, who is that visiting team that can go in and go steal a game on the road? Texas Southern and Alcorn. Bam, you at UAPB, Prairie View at Jackson State on Saturday night, and then Bethune-Cookman at Valley. I'm, I'm curious as to who is that road team uh, that can go in and rip one away from the home team. Uh, should be a fascinating matchup this weekend, especially can Bethune-Cookman get themselves uh, back on the uh, winning side of the ledger because we saw Valley. They got some fight in them uh, with, with regards to how they came back against Texas Southern this past month. Anything happens on Monday. Those are the weird days. Yeah, and I guess the surprise team to me still in a lot of ways was Texas Southern Tigers. I mean, they were yeah. that close for winning three in a row. Credit again to the Delta Devils, and you made an excellent point. Things just happen like that on uh, Mondays. Uh, but a team that seems to be putting some things together that we probably didn't expect in a lot of ways, uh, credit to the Texas Southern Tigers coach over there getting it done. It'll be interesting uh, as a young team, can they put that loss behind them yeah. and now go on the road and least split? Uh, obviously, Jackson State is a tough one, but it'd be interesting to see how they plan it. Then. You know, can right. they put themselves in a position maybe to steal one? But if not, can they represent themselves to show that they are in that top echelon of the SWAC as it's a long uh, regular season, obviously, with 18 games, but you still want to put yourself in a position where you get those top four seeds. Uh, it's just something about, in the tournament, having those top four seeds. Yeah, and they've proven thus far, I mean, that was a head-turning victory over UAPB. Zay Green was in a little bit of foul trouble, but uh, you're talking about Kariah Beck, you're talking about uh, Maya Pete. This is That's still a very talented UAPB team. And for Texas Southern to hold serve at home and get the win over UAPB, that was big. So I'm kind of looking to see how this team is kind of maturing during the course of the season. Got another, you know, giant slayer sort of action uh, this weekend going to Jackson. Good points you're making there. Let's slide over to the MEAC uh, in terms of big games this weekend. You got Norfolk State, Howard. Norfolk State is on the road. Howard used to be in the mix. I'm not sure if they'll be ready to get it this year. But you surprisingly have Coppin State. They got off to a 2-0 and mark. So they at least in terms of not having a loss are keeping up for Norfolk State. And if they want to make that a, you know, a nice matchup down the road, they got to find a way to get it done against Morgan State to keep up with that. And then you also have, you know, that North Carolina Central, South Carolina State, uh, just to see who's going to stay again in that top four. I don't think anybody's really going to mess with Norfolk State, but Coppin State can at least make it interesting and at least keeping up with them with staying undefeated. So I'm a little interested in terms of that matchup. Anything over there, and the MEAC has your attention. Not this weekend, because I think Norfolk State will uh, do what they need to do uh, uh, in terms of uh, holding serving as University of Mary Washington. But next week, uh, January 27th, huge matchup, Coppin State coming into Norfolk State. So we'll see if Coppin State can carry forward that momentum going on the road to Norfolk State. Norfolk State, they won five in a row. Looks like they'll get six uh, uh, on the 22nd of this month. Uh, but that's going to be a fascinating matchup to see. Uh, who is a team that can take on this very tough uh, Norfolk State team that can both score, rebound, and play great defense? Let me give you a little bit about the mid-majors. Um, not a lot of changes in the poll. In fact, everything stays the same. But for the sake of time, I did want to just break down and give you what these teams are doing. Fayetteville State, the Lady Broncos, they still stay in the number one spot. Uh, they improved with two big wins, 14-1, 7-0. Uh, but going from the descending order at number five is Xavier, Louisiana. Uh, they fall from previous being ranked two. Uh, they had a loss this week, but they have improved to 11-3, 8-1 overall over there in uh, the Red River Athletic Conference. At number four, Kentucky State, Lady Thoroughbreds continue to impress. They did fall a slot, 13-2, 9-0, but they just keep winning. Uh, number three, Russ Lady Bearcats are 15 and 3, 7 and 1. Mm. They earned a first place vote this week, moving up with 61 points, moving up from the four spot. And number three, Virginia State Low Lady Trojans are really setting up, which could be an interesting matchup against Fayetteville State. 
They improved to 15 and 1, 7 and 1, one first place vote, 73 points, jumping all the way up from number five. Uh, as I said, number one, Fayetteville State Lady Broncos continue to get it done. 14 and 1, 7 and 0, six first place votes. Wanted to give a little love to the mid major division uh, as we broke that down. Yeah, the one that I'm looking forward to this weekend, Kentucky State, 9-0 in conference play. Miles, 8-0 in conference play. Well, uh, Miles goes to Kentucky State this weekend. You're talking about the number one scoring team in SIAC, uh, Kentucky State, number one defensive team in Miles. Uh, that should be a great matchup, and we'll see who comes away with the victory in that one. That's going to be a good one. Yes, somebody has to take that L. We'll somebody got to get that undefeated, yeah. though. It'll be fascinating to see. What happens on Saturday? With that being said, that's all for the women. We'll take our next break. We'll come back and get into the men, starting with the major division. Stick with us. Be right back after this next break. Since 2002, Empowerment Resources, Inc., a nonprofit organization, has empowered more than 1,500 youth and adults in Duval and surrounding counties. Through its programs, Journey into Womanhood, Girls Mentoring, Life Skills for Teens, and parenting education coaching. To get involved with programs, volunteer, or donate, visit www.empowermentresourcesinc.org. Follow us on social media, facebook.com forward slash empowerment.resources and instagram.com forward slash empowermentjax. The human voice has always connected audiences with experiences. Major brands all across America have trusted Kevers Voice time and time again. Conversational. Powerhouse, intelligent and sincere. That's the voice you need for your creative marketing process. K E A V E R S V O I C E dot com. Covers voice, covers voice, covers voice dot com. Always on, all the time. Nope. Nope. You want him? Ooh, I like him. The Quicker Picker Upper. Bounty picks up messes quicker, and each sheet is two times more absorbent, so you can use less. He's an eight. He's a nine. Bounty, the Quicker Picker Upper. From novice to aficionado, find yourself here. High quality cigars plus personal customer service. Slow Burn is Waco's only mobile cigar lounge, featuring a meticulous curated collection of premium cigars. Visit our website www.slowburnwaco.com That's www.slowburnwaco.com Compress the analytic data with your hip hop If you know them like I know them They gon' tell you if your team If they want a lot yeah. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And pay attention Boy. Cause he gon' teach a lesson yes. This is Dr. Mills inside the HBC Sports Lab with Charles Bishop. Let's get into the men's side of things, the major division inside the HBCU Huddle Report. Week number two, let's get into these poll rankings. Dropping out this week with the Southern Jaguar. Whoa. Day three and one. But check this out. We were on our messenger as we do watching these games, and they were really taking the two for them cookmen. The crowd was quiet, couldn't get in there. Coach was stomping up and down the field. I mean, up and down the court because his players just could not get a call. They couldn't get a basket to go, and then they started rolling. But before that, I said, could Southern and Jackson State stay undefeated because they were the last two teams until they match up and be 8-0 going up against each other? Well, <laughs> the bethune Goodman Wildcats said, not so fast, my friend, and they made sure that that didn't happen. And it cost Southern Jaguars a spot in the top five. As you see, they fall out to nine and eight, three and one. So let's look at those teams receiving votes in terms of the poll rankings. Receiving votes in terms of the next slide there is Alabama State Hornets. Uh, they uh, are in the mix at nine and nine, three and one, 42 points. Southern Jaguars still stay in that top 10, if you would, just receiving votes at nine and eight, three and one with 38 points. Howard Bison are at eight and eleven, two and one. They started off slow, but uh, a tough, a tough loss. North Carolina Central, but they've won their last two, 29 points, so they're doing well in terms of that. 
how Herman Shelton says Howard don't sleep on the Howard Bison. Yeah, it should be fascinating. I got to see him live when they took on uh, Texas Southern and teams down there in the Chris Paul Classic in Las Vegas. Uh, nice match up there. They went down to the wire. But then Cookman uh, was also receiving votes after getting that big, much needed win. They are at 79 as they improved to 2 and 1 in the conference with 26 points. Let's get into our next slide at number five and look at those top five teams getting into the mix this week. Tennessee State Tigers. Uh, hmm. They were not ranked. They jumped into the poll after being. In week zero, they fall out last week. They righted the ship a little bit, kind of up and down. But they're in the mix at number five, Tennessee State Tigers at 9-9, 2-3, and nine, two and three, 61 points, not ranked. They have Tennessee Tech coming in today, so it should be fascinating to see if they can kind of get on a roll and win a couple of victories. We'll see what that looks like as they play this evening. Bring us to number four. Four in the top ranking is gentlemen mm. taking the Hornets. 9-9, 2-0, surprising everybody. But if you got a chance to see them in a couple of those non-conference games, uh, they got it going. This is a team that defeated Grambling State in Atlanta uh, for that classic that was held over there. And they had a couple of other big wins in terms of the Division uh, two rankings. They actually had five Division one wins, including that win over Grambling. Uh, they are at number four with 74 points. They do fall a spot this week. Uh, because of what Jackson State did uh, as they are uh, pushing their way to the top. They're at number three. Jackson State Tigers uh, improved to 79, 3-0 in the conference race, and they look good, 83 points, as they continue to climb up the ranking. The rest of it is all about the MIAC. At number two, Norfolk State Spartans, 11-8, 1-1, five, uh, five first-place votes, 104 in that Big road loss to North Carolina Central. Again, these teams didn't play. Norfolk State Spartans did play a conference, con conference game where they beat up on uh, Virginia University, Lynchburg. Uh, but that's enough about that. Bringing us to number one, North Carolina Central Eagles, 10-7 and seven on the season, 2-0. and oh. Coach Moulton seems like he got the Eagles ready to go and play in high. We'll see what that looks like as 105 points remaining number one. Charles, let me know what do you think of the top five poll rankings this week in week number two of the major division poll rankings. Still, still early in the season, but uh, Delaware State, and you mentioned them with uh, five uh, D1 wins, and they have the number one scorer in the MIAC in Martez uh, Robinson, a guy who can really fill it up. Uh, who is going to take that shot at the Blue Bloods of North Carolina Central and the, North Carolina and the Norfolk State Spartans? Will it be Delaware State? Uh, can Howard uh, move their way back up into the mix? Uh, like uh, Herman Shelton said, keep an eye on Howard. Jackson State is a team that's been very impressive to me thus far. Uh, speaking of which, they got a win over Howard, Chris Paul Class, correct? Yes, they did. Yeah, and, and they started off. Tremendous. Got a win over a as well. Got a win over North Carolina a t as well. They started off tremendous uh, in swag play. A uh, huge win over Alabama State thus far uh, uh, in swag play. And Alcorn defending a uh, regular season swag champion. Interesting matchup this weekend. Texas Southern and Prairie View come into Jackson. Uh, both teams can be in a nickel. Uh, we've seen the best of Texas Southern. And we've seen at times the worst of Texas Southern. Which team travels to Jackson this weekend? Prairie View, we know they're going to play great defense. You know, can they slow down Jackson State's rebounding and, and, and Ken Evans' ability to score? So that, this is a very uh, very interesting matchup this weekend with uh, Texas Southern and Prairie View uh, coming into Jackson. I expect that gymnasium to be packed out. I agree with you. That's a fascinating <clears throat> matchup. You know, the Texas teams, we talk about what they do at home in terms of the Texas road step going out there, but they're very formidable going on the road as well. And it's just two tough back-to-back -to -back, uh, games when you play those teams. So it's interesting to see. Uh, can they split on the road is usually a preferable term we like to talk about in the SWAC. But when you got a team like Jackson, they're going to want to be greedy. They're going to want to get two at home. And you can't blame them. It's so fascinating. And then you know how tough it is to go down to all corn, uh, no matter what's going on. Yeah. Uh, obviously, that seems like they're pushing back and riding the ship as Coach Bussey is not going to be down. Uh, they played some tremendous matchups. They got two big wins last weekend as they kind of righted the ship after that tough opening weekend loss up in Jackson. You're talking about going uh, up there and getting a win against Alabama A&M. So it's fascinating. A lot of good basketball. 
Let me stay in the swag since you talk about some of these matchups. Uh, you have Southern and Gramlin again on the men's oh, side. Oh, man. So That's if you go. want to see some good basketball, <laughs> you can get up to Gramlin. You got two feature matchups. You see what's going on on the women's side. Well, guess what? The men like it as well. Southern comes in at 9-8, and 3-1. and one. Uh, Obviously had that tough road loss to Bethune-Cookman. Now they continue to be on the road, but they take up Gramlin, 6-11, and 3-1. and one. Uh, Roland had a tough loss. The Texas Southern, the team that you talked about is kind of enigma, they got Gramlin. Other than that, Gramlin is rolling, and we knew that they would have the pieces. The last time we seen these teams take off, they were in the NBA TV uh, matchup over the All-Star weekend, and it was a classic game there. Well, now they're back in the cozy confines uh, of their arena there, and Gramlin should be fascinating. Shout out to Gramlin because they'll take on Jackson State as we talk about it. They'll be in New Jersey. Uh, in that classic up there in terms of the QQQ legacy uh, classic up there in Prudential Arena. So that's fascinating. A little ahead of the time, that's in February, but that's a matchup that I'm also interested in. What do you think about Grambling and Southern on the men's side of the dish? Oh, that's going to be that's gonna be a fun matchup. Uh, like we mentioned, uh, just like on the, on the women's side, uh, you, you, you got two rivals going at each other. So uh, that's what's going, to go, what's going to make that a really, really fun atmosphere in Grambling this weekend. Uh, let me go back. Shout out to Bethune-Cookman and Moore Gymnasium. That place was rocking uh, this past Monday. A tremendous overtime game against Southern uh, for Bethune-Cookman to fight back and get that W. Uh, it, it's making me kind of look at them a little bit closer now in terms of what Reggie Theus is doing with that program. Very interesting matchup. Uh, they got Valley Saturday, but they go to UAPB on Monday, and I think that's going to be a fascinating matchup as well. We all know that UAPB is a tough place to play as well, and everybody's back now. Uh, kids are back in school, ready to rock. Then you, don't you have a transfer that came from Bethune Cookman that's over there? Yeah, Club, so that's exactly. More intriguing as well. Another little storyline, uh, yeah. Exactly, another storyline there. Shout out to the Cat Eye Network. Uh, doing great a great job, job great job announcing that game and making sure they get the visuals of the arena. So um, it's fascinating. You know, obviously there's been some concerns out there in terms of some of these uh, matchups where they're on YouTube or behind a paywall. Uh, but Cat Eye Network, uh, they get it done right. Shout Phen- out to phenomenal. Mississippi Valley State in terms of the young duo doing uh, that work in terms of the mic. Uh, a little different, but they get excited and they bring you into it in terms of how – they call the game down there at the Delta Devil. So I want to give a little love for, for those folks getting it done. But let's look over here to the MEAC before I uh, give you some updates in terms of what it looks like with the mid-major, just uh, some poll rankings there. With that being said, North Carolina Central, South Carolina State this Saturday, I don't think that's going to be a problem for North Carolina Central. But right. I want to see if they can keep that momentum. They were all for basically a week. Um, and you know how some coaches feel about that. You lose a little bit of your rhythm. Um, you get in there. You are on the roll. Uh, how can they make that happen? The other game that's really going to be fascinating, though, that you got to have your eyes on is that Norfolk State traveling to Howard. We know what took place last year in the MEAC championship game. And I'm sure uh, the players may be a little different, but the coaches are not, and they sure hadn't forgot about that matchup, uh, how – uh, particularly for the Spartans, is thinking they had it, three-peat. Uh, as much as you've seen Texas Southern Tigers did it, it was not to be. Shout-out to Howard getting it done, the daily double, because they won the regular season, and then the tournament. Well, we got a rematch for 2024 uh, as both teams come in wanting to do well. So I'm fascinated in terms of this matchup on Saturday between uh, Howard and uh, Norfolk State. Norfolk State and uh, has that – uh, loss, so they won and won. Howard comes in at two and one, so you really don't want to take that second loss. So in a lot of ways, this is a fascinating matchup. What do you think about that, Charles? Uh, that's going to be a great matchup. I think we got some we got some great matchups this weekend. Like you said, uh, it's a rematch of what we saw in the tournament last year uh, in Norfolk State going into Howard. Oh, man, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, you know, we'll be scoreboard watching pretty tough this weekend, Doc. <laughs> I agree. You know, I'm going to find a way to get it in there. But that being said, top five matchups, mid-major division. I want to get this in here. Uh, we do have a new team that jumps in the top five. Clark Atlanta Panthers with that major upset. Uh, number eight, they find their way up in terms of the top five programs. Clark Atlanta Panthers, uh, they are sitting at 11-3, 5-3, 47 points 
number five, they were not ranked. And number two, yeah, Xavier, Louisiana, the gold rush, 11-3, 72. They dropped a spot uh, from three last weekend. Talladega, Tornadoes, continue to tear it up in the GCAC, 15-1, 64 uh, points. They move up a spot for number four last week. Benedict, despite the loss, they stay at number two, 13-1, 71. Langston Lions, number two in the nation. What else can you say? Mm. Undefeated, 15-0, and 9-0, and eight for first place votes. Now the only undefeated team among the HBC ranks. 80 points, they get there. Charles, any thoughts on the mid-major division? I mean, so far, Langston, 15 and 0, they're sucking up all the oxygen over there in the mid major. So, uh, shout out to Langston Lions for getting it done over there. Good stuff, good stuff. I, I can't wait to continue to see just how far they rack up those wins and what goes on. So, I certainly have an eye over there in Oklahoma with the Langston Lions as they continue to move the needle and get it done. With that, let's take our last break. We'll come back on the other side. We'll get into some of the dialogue about FAMU, share some thoughts, and let the turn tables turn. We'll, let, we'll be right back after this uh, final break. We'll come back on the other side and get into it. Stick with us. Be right back after this break. If you think all pads are exactly the same, think again. This is Always Ultra Thins reinvented with the Always Triple Protection System. This pad wicks gushes 90% faster absorbs even more so you can feel dry and locks odors in. Rethink your pad for up to 100% leak-free and odor-free comfort with the totally reinvented Always Ultra Thins. This is always like never before. The Cuvée Group is a Florida-based marketing and training consulting firm. We help businesses communicate to their target audience and engage them in conversation. We also help to expand their audiences, which will ultimately result in growth for those organizations. In addition to being a certified constant contact specialist, my colleagues and I are also certified in John Maxwell leadership principles. We use these proven principles to conduct workshops, training, and private coaching sessions for individuals and companies looking to take things to the next level. Contact us to schedule a free consultation. Issues today, don't delay, call Cuvay. As technology continues to bring changes to the world of education, it's time we also reimagine teacher professional development. Gone are the days of one-size-fits-all learning that can only be accessed at a specific time and place. The Stride PD Center is an on-demand library of mobile-friendly courses that allow educators to learn anytime and anywhere. Our dynamic courses provide bite-sized learning and help educators advance their knowledge while also gaining professional development hours. The best professional development plans are those that include a level of flexibility and choice for educators. Whether you're a teacher, school, or district, visit us today to take charge of your learning. Compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they're going to tell you if your team, if they want a lot, yeah, and who's about, who's about. So listen to Professor yes, sir. Yes, sir. and pay attention because he's going to teach a lesson. This is Dr. Mill inside the HBC Sports Lab. Charles, I know you were fascinating, uh, and I like the term you use, uh, family culture wars, you know, <laughs> in terms of just looking at, you know, what is going on, you know, some questions that are out there for some people, you know, are there any of the affinity groups, booster groups that have the strength to run an AD proposed higher. Yeah. Uh, and I just wanted you to kind of to opine and further explain what are your thoughts in terms of what do you mean by getting into this battle? What, what, what I thought was very fascinating is we kind of started taking a look at this FAMU coaching search since the departure of Willie Simmons was the voice that the affinity groups, uh, as well as the booster groups and the National Alumni Association uh, had within that coaching search. And I thought that it was rather unique because I don't know if we see it uh, to that extent around the SWAC or around the HBCU stratosphere. And I thought it was very fascinating uh, to kind of look at from a 30,000 foot view, you know, how these groups are uh, have a, a very loud voice within 
uh, their coaching search, and you presented a framework that I thought was phenomenal to kind of share with the audience in regard to the governance structure uh, at FAMU, as well as looking at uh, the state of Florida and how these affinity groups or booster groups have uh, the voice that they do have. Yeah, I think that's an important um, framework, and I'm glad that you asked and brought that to the attention so we can kind of share it. But I want to park that for a minute before we get into that detail of the question and kind of maybe level set everything, if you would, in regards to some frameworks. So in a lot of cases, when we look at coaching hires, particularly for football, to some degree, basketball, and some programs uh, that have a big affinity to baseball, this can be true there. And also, to some degree, maybe women's basketball. Outside of that, um, you tend to have coaching hires that nobody really hears about and see until it's announced. Volleyball, women's soccer, if you would. Um, and to some, even track and field, you don't necessarily see a lot of uh, humbug, if you would, in terms of people's interest and in what takes place there. So that's fascinating when you compartmentalize that to football on that side of things. You know, why is it has this type of interest? And the major reason which gets back to some of what you were talking about is the key stakeholders. Who are the key stakeholders and why are there so many people that are interested in football, basketball, maybe to some level, and as we said, even baseball. And part of that is uh, the obvious thing that we have to say it loud is the interest in football, basketball, in regards to that. Mm -hmm. And it's not just from affinity groups, not just from fans, booster groups, uh, but it's also from the administrative side. And you have some presidents that take a very laid back approach. Um, I, I hired an athletic director, uh, VP of athletics. Um, they, they know what I want to get done in terms of athletics and I'm going to trust what they bring to us. And then you have the uniqueness of some HBCUs that have a direct board they report to. Texas Southern, Southern University, Alabama State, FAMU, Alabama a and North Carolina a and some of these places where they have a direct board of governors, regents, trustees, depending on what state uh, they may use them, uh, different names in terms of what they use to refer to them. But they are boards that do the governing. And in some cases, these board members have some intrigue and interest about uh, football, basketball hires in themselves and may have more input. But what people may not realize is you'll hear people talk about, you know, an AD should be able to make their hire. I think people do not realize that even at the power five level, uh, an AD, a VP of athletics does not unilaterally make a hire. First of all, the, the framework of this is that, that the uh, president chancellor operates the university and it goes to them. So regardless of what takes place and how much weight a VP athletics has, they're only making a recommendation. In universities across the country, private, public, it doesn't matter, that a hire cannot take place unless it's proved by the board. So even the president is making a recommendation to the board. And usually things take place and they're quiet. doesn't matter. It just happens, right? You make a recommendation, people go away. So they almost think like the AD is doing it. But even if you're talking about these Power 5 programs, while it may happen very fast, you better believe that key stakeholders, those million-dollar donors, are having mm -hmm. a voice at the table. Now, they mm -hmm. may be smooth with theirs. They may go to uh, the couch, and I'm going to be maybe a little male chauvinist, even though some women smoke cigars as well. And trust me, there's some power brokers out there that are women. Don't let it fool you. They have big money, too. And they like their wine. Some of them might even like a strong cocktail, cognac or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> like that whiskey. They, they, yeah. yeah. they don't call and talk about it. They list and they come out and they have their cigars, they have their wine, uh, you know, cocktail, and they talk about what they want to get done. Um, and after they coalesce, chop up names, short list by the AD, whatever, once they have enough common agreement, come. And next thing you know, they moving. Now, this happens fast for them. You know, these are sessions that they have planning. A lot of times you'll have folks making a decision if they're going to dismiss somebody. 
So they already have a short list. They already talk about, and so they can make that pretty fast. Or um, if a coach retires, oftentimes somebody at that level, they're going to tell people a little bit early, hey, I'm thinking about this. I'm ready to go in. People go into motion. So it doesn't take a lot. So those are some of the things that I wanted to kind of level set in regards to your question. And I'll let you go back and kind of ballpark your question again uh, so we can go over it and kind of get the butts as I took a long way about, but wanted to level set uh, what that meant. Well, I, I, and going back to the question, the question becomes, I thought, from my perspective, it's very rather unique uh, that you had booster groups, National Alumni Association, affinity groups that all sort of had uh, a loud voice within this culture search, uh, so much so to the point to uh, the name that we heard was the leading candidate for the head coaching job at FAMU uh, was no longer in the running. Uh, and you had this this sort of issue uh, with regards to the way the athletic director went about uh, the process. But I, I thought it was unique enough to, to, to go back and take a look at how their voice became so loud because I don't particularly see that or I have not seen this at – Texas Southern, Prairie View, Jackson State, so on and so forth around the HBC landscape. I think that's important because we've seen some very powerful uh, institutions in terms of <clears throat> the alumni group, in terms of how they travel is a lot of times how we measure them, right? How, and now in these days, how vocal they are on the social media various platforms to kind of engage the interests of them. Oh. And oftentimes they are seen as a booster group. You know, who runs that? And oftentimes you see it in terms of National Alumni Association, these affinity groups that are involved. And they have different various ways of how they show their power, how they're involved in terms of groups. And it is unique at FAMU from my perspective. But the way that it's kind of unique is the fact that the governing law, legislative laws in regards to no support of uh, finances can be spent on athletics. Now, a lot of people say, hold on, Kavir, we, we've seen that in Texas. That, that's not necessarily unique. And you're correct. Uh, but in a way, there are some other legal parameters, legislative rules that talk about the balancing of budgets, which is unique to FAMU versus other institutions. While there is a desire to balance the budget, if they go over or go under a little bit, it's not necessarily a big deal. They use money. Uh, from different areas in terms of general funds, uh, booster group, affinity groups will help support that, and they just keep it moving. So in Florida, you've seen for the last 10 years, there is a real internal uh, dynamic that says these budgets and athletics, and across the university for that matter, but we worry about athletics here is that they must be balanced. Well, what does that do? Well, at FAMU, a lot of that money comes for these affinity groups. Mm. So unlike some places, maybe Southern, uh, Prairie View, Jackson State, where a uh, booster group, alumni association will have a collective of funds uh, where they allow the athletic director to use these funds in terms of that group. And some of that may be used uh, to provide some type of bonuses to the coaches or some type of part of their uh, uh, their their financial uh, components of the contract to support them. Well, at FAMU, a lot of that money it goes to help support the budget part of FAMU. And so what does that do? Over the years, that has empowered this group more than any other place. Uh, and so they have become more organized from our National Alumni Association, also in terms of the uh, booster groups, the two groups out there, and so when you become more empowered and you're giving significant money, you're going to more, want more uh, say at the table in terms of how things go. And that's a unique thing that I'm not sure has really been pointed out in terms of the history over the years that have created that framework, uh, particularly when you talk about athletic fees. FAMU does have athletic fees, but the university uh, may have a different stance than other universities when you look at some of these reports it come out on the USA Today. It talks about how much a university uses in terms of those athletic fees. It's different when you talk about FAMU, what they use the percentage-wise towards their total budget, which means that money has to come from somewhere else. And it's coming from those affinity groups 
And you know, like anything, the more that you're involved in terms of what you provide financially, the more that you're going to want to have a say of what goes on because it's your money. So, so let me be a fan for a second. We saw Alabama hire within a day. We saw the same thing. Washington, they move on to the next coach. And the, the domino effect, of uh, uh, Arizona now has a new coach. Is it the culture of HBCU coaching searches that we have to go through this long, drawn-out process where, you know, everybody gets to say, the search committee, and we've lost <laughs> precious time now in the transfer portal because kids are like, you know what, enough, bye. You know, or, you know, we, we missed out on recruiting the season. And, you know, it, 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 as a fan, it becomes really frustrating to sit back and watch time lapse to where we're not building up our team. 30,000 foot view. It really, it really, this is where it gets tricky because it's not just a uniform HBCU culture. Uh, because different institutions slightly do it different ways. I mean, there are some general state rules that are on the books, particularly if you're using university funds, right, uh, and you're going through the HR process, that means that you're going to have some HR regarding rules, uh, state rules that you have to post a position. It may have to be posted for so many days. Oftentimes what we do not really consider when we're talking about these Power Fives is a significant amount of money. For example, Nick Saban, before he left, you know, only 400 k or so was coming from the university to fund. The rest of 800.5 million, I should 8.5 million of his 9 million or 9.5 of his $10 million contract were coming from these affinity groups. Really the largest part is coming from these television deals and money associated, which are coaching shows, right? Uh, car, mm -hmm. car dealerships and all these things. And that's why they get all these large significant gifts in terms of cars, uh, houses, oftentimes that they get uh, money for their housing, uh, food allowances, uh, investment plans and programs. All this stuff is coming from outside. Apparel deals helps to aggregate that other nine plus million dollars to pay for a coaching. So that creates a whole different environment, the speed that you can do stuff because of that. But to your point, you're right. Some HBCUs have moved to another model where the AD has a lot more say in terms of making that. But you better believe this. Even then, those ADs have a really good job of working with their affinity groups of saying, hey, this is the direction you're going. It may be a very quiet conversation, a telephone call or a meeting with two or three people at a dinner, and they move really fast, and they kind of lay out the land. This is the direction I want to go. This is why. This is what's going. And even though a person may not get the name that they want, the fact that they were involved helps speed up the process. And so that's all these key stakeholders. It doesn't matter where they are, whether it's the board, president, affinity groups outside of the organization, you have to find a way to have the nuance to be able to talk through that process. So ultimately, if you do want to put a candidate, you want to do it. But you're right. There are some programs across the landscape uh, that have the need to this old mantra, which is really endeared to higher ed. Because you see this with provost hires, deans hires, faculty hires, where everybody is involved in terms of having their voice, setting up a committee of these stakeholders in terms of who this person is. So you go through a lot of rapid fire to be hired in higher education for some of these administrative positions. So yes, some people just believe that's fundamental to higher education, whether it's academics or athletics, for that to take place. So as much as a, a help uh, that affinity groups, booster groups, National Alumni Association can be, the flip question to that is, are there a hindrance in that they, everybody does want their hand in the cookie jar? Uh, obviously, they can be. I mean, it's like anything. It's a blessing and a curse. And depending on uh, somebody's ability to coordinate all this, uh, they can be a very much a help financially. Uh, they might just also have some nuances of the institution that you may not consider. 
So creating those relationships, getting that information is very important. So, yes, on one side, they can be very positive. But obviously, like anything, you go too far, it can be negative. And uh, too much involvement uh, in regards to that can be a detriment, uh, particularly if somebody doesn't want it for the first place. <laughs> uh, but that's where I'm trying to say that there's a healthy mix in the middle of where you want to find the synergy of getting people in the same place. And if you really think about this, this is not just in athletics. Any leader across the board in any organization has to coalesce people and their ability for them to ro lay out their roadmap of what they want to get done in the organization. And then they got to find a way to what we call to get the buy-in. Mm -hmm. And so part of this is just the natural components of a leader, the leadership framework. I don't care what organization, you know, whether it's from, you know, for fraternity, sororities, since we're celebrating these holidays this month or a civic organization, a peewee organization, or all the way up to a Fortune 500 company with a CEO. They still have boards. Uh, they have individuals out there and all these folks that are walking from the bottom of the organization to the top. They got to get them going in the same direction or things are just not going to work out well for that organization. And at that level, it's big money involved in terms of billions and millions of dollars. And you've seen CEOs that have been put out of their organization because yeah. they couldn't do it very well. These are CEOs, for the most part, that had success at another organization. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why they were brought into a different organization, because they've been able to show that. Sometimes it's just the ability to navigate the space for somebody uh, the first time in that type of leadership role. Sometimes there's some you know, heartbreak of kind of learning the ropes of what it means to lead. And so... Uh, everybody can't be seasoned. Uh, we never would have any new people taking on that. So you knew, need folks, but oftentimes there can be some bumps in the roads in regards to that. That's why I tell coaches, ADs, uh, to really consider, you know, what job they're lining up for. So don't just get so excited about being the head person. Make sure you really look at uh, the synergy in regards to where you want to start your career when the first time you're talking about being a leader, whether it's the head coach uh, or whether it's the, you know, athletic director, VP, president, chancellor, provost, deans, you know, it's very important that you really not only let people interview you, but you interview the organization and do your research in terms of the culture. Anytime mm -hmm. we talk about internships with these young students, one of the things we talk about them preparing for the interview, right, to make sure they do their research on the organization. We also ask them as they go into it to make sure that they are considering about doing the interview as well, that they ask really good questions um, so they understand, is this a place I really want to work, particularly when you start talking about your career. So all these things are important when we start looking at the landscape uh, from not just being in a leadership position, but taking your steps to uh, deciding what job you want to take in a leadership position as well. No doubt. That's a fascinating discussion. Uh, and I know we had to kind of uh, bring it to the forefront a little bit today, uh, uh, along with all this nuance. So I appreciate you providing that insight uh, because it's something that we're, a lot of us were just kind of asking that question. I think it's a fair question, and I'm glad you brought it up. We'll see if we can do a little bit more of this uh, throughout the uh, rest of the year about getting in and turning the table for me from being host to allow you and the host to put up some points particularly when things go in the landscape and people have questions and may want to get a little more insight and information, what it looks like beyond the pale of just the general discussion uh, of what people think uh, about a certain position. Hopefully it's provided a little more uh, back log in terms of what that looks like to give a little more ingredients of how it takes place. So appreciate you. With that, let's close it out. Thank you for listening to Dr. Villas inside the HBC Sports Lab. Make sure you share our podcast with your friends and colleagues. I am Dr. Yadika Bill, the Dean of HBC Sports, coming from inside the lab in the College of HBC Sports uh, with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop as we come to the close, 478 and counting to 500. Uh, again, we want to thank you for listening to Dr. Bill's Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop every Tuesday and Thursday at 6 o'clock Central Standard Time. Again, we want to thank you for listening to Dr. Bill's Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop, every Tuesday and Thursday at 6 o'clock. We look forward to next week uh, as we get into it on Thursday. We'll give you some more latest and updates.
updates on the news as we got it done today. Uh, we'll get into next week uh, as we get going. Follow me, Dr. Yadikaville, D-R-K-E-N-Y-A-T-T-A-C-A-V-I-L, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Will you give you an update on all these games? Charles told you what he's interested in. Love to hear what you're interested in. And we'll see you back on the other side here on Tuesday. Dream big. Continue to move forward. We will talk with you soon. Charles? Of course. Lecture? Charles? Di dismissed. <laughs>